Andy Camp. And, uh, uh, hi, hi, uh, hi. My, uh, my, 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 my name is uh, 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 Andy Campbell, and uh, welcome to the uh, Knock Your Socks Off World of pub Public Speaking. Are you afraid? I don't mean of me. I'm Tim and I'm harmless. I mean, are you afraid of public speaking? Maybe you're confused. A little sleepy, cranky. Well, if you bought this tape, you're expecting to someday find yourself in a situation where you have to get up and speak in front of a large crowd. And whether you need to give a classroom speech or the most important business presentation of your life, you've probably got a bunch of questions and concerns. Maybe you're afraid you're going to get up there and just blank out. Uh, um, maybe you're afraid your speech will be all over the place. When I was young, I used to go camping at Loon Mountain with my father. Now, a lot of people aren't a big fan of Christmas. I might you think that, uh, Bono, uh, but back to financial reform. Or maybe you're afraid you'll be so nervous you just won't show up. Well, in this program, we'll address all those concerns. We'll show you how to deliver your speech in style, how to organize your speech to a T, and how to combat that gut-wrenching stage fright you might be feeling. We'll talk about preparation, speech research, delivery, all the tools you need to get up there and speak like a pro. We're the Standard Deviants, and we've got you covered. So let's get down to business. Part 1. Preparing to Speak. Whether you're delivering a political campaign speech, a heartfelt eulogy, or a presentation to business associates, you'll want to carefully prepare before you deliver a speech. Now I know what you're thinking. How can I prepare to give a speech when I'm paralyzed by mind-numbing fear and I can't get out of bed? Well, we understand your nervousness. And it's important that you understand that the first step in preparing to give a speech or presentation is to conquer your fear of actually giving it. That's why you're going to want to pay close attention to the first section of this videotape. Section A, Communication Apprehension. Communication Apprehension, commonly known as stage fright, often described as butterflies in the stomach. You know what we're talking about. You get a letter in the mail. You're happy. Everyone likes mail. <laughs> why, it's from the local PTA. And they want you to give a speech on the merits of building a children's recreation center for your town. And why not? You've always been vocal on the matter of telling friends how badly the neighborhood kids need a place to play. This is your chance to make a difference. This is your chance to shine. But then, it hits you. That slight tickle of fear at the base of your spine. That cold trickle of sweat that rolls down your cheek. That energetic tap dancer who suddenly appears in your stomach to dance the first two acts of showboat. It's communication. Apprehension. Other symptoms begin to creep up. You can't sleep. You can't eat. You begin to come up with excuses for why you can't possibly deliver that speech. Maybe I should clean the garage next week. That place is so cluttered, I uh, probably won't have time for anything else. Like a terrifying public speaking engagement. <laughs> well, don't let communication apprehension stop you from speaking. It may seem like you're all alone or that this fear is ridiculous, but the truth is, Communication apprehension is the most common fear in the world, even more common than the fear of death. But the most important thing you need to remember is that communication apprehension is a fear that you can easily get a handle on. A lot of people believe that CA is a learned response, that people's fear of public speaking is grounded in a bad public speaking experience. By that token, if people begin to have positive public speaking experiences, 
their fear should decrease. I know what you're thinking. How does this help you in the short run? What can you do if you feel like you're about to implode right before a speech? Well, there are certain alternative methods. We've all heard about the trick where you imagine your audience naked. This might work, but if you have an overactive imagination, you might mess up and imagine yourself naked. The best way to combat the fear of public speaking is to learn how to relax yourself. Here's four easy steps that'll help you do just that. Okay, you're nervous. What do you do? What do you do? Well, step number one is to admit to yourself that you're nervous. Acknowledge your fears, but also realize that you can overcome them. Just remind yourself that you have something valuable to say and that the audience isn't likely to be hostile toward you. Step two, think about what you're going to say and what effect you'll have on your audience. The more you think about your subject and your relationship with the audience, the less you'll think about your fear. Step three, act confident. Sure, you're nervous, but the audience doesn't have to know that. If you project confidence, the audience will react positively, and this will increase your confidence even more. And finally, step four, start strong and end strong. A strong introduction will propel you through the rest of your speech and wipe out any fear you begin with. Ending strong will also counteract a shaky beginning due to nervousness. It might help you out to keep in mind that speaker apprehension isn't a sickness that needs to be cured. You're not going to erase the fear from your life. Chances are, you'll always be a little bit afraid before you get up in front of a large crowd. We all are. The key is to learn to deal with your fear and control it, so that it doesn't control you. So the absolute best thing you can do is take a deep breath, recognize your fear for what it is, and write the best possible speech you can. Because preparation is the key to overcoming your public speaking woes. And, conveniently enough, preparation is what we're talking about next. Section B. Supporting material. Whether your speech is persuasive or informative in nature, you'll be making some sort of point, offering some kind of opinion. And in order to support that point or opinion, you'll need to organize some supporting material. You'll need to do a little research. The goal of research is to gather supporting materials. These are factual materials and opinions that back up the main ideas of your speech. Every type of support material projects your ideas in a slightly different way. By using all kinds of different support materials, you can increase an audience's interest in your speech. Just remember, for each type of support material you decide to use, ask yourself four important questions. Is this accurate? Is this specific? Is this clear to my audience? And most importantly, is this relevant? That in mind, let's take a look at some common types of supporting material. Factual materials. Factual materials can be broken down into three different categories. They are facts, definitions, and statistics. Facts. Facts are units of information that can be verified by independent observers. So if you were presenting an informative speech on television sitcoms of the 80s, a fact would be that the show Growing Pains had a character named Boner. That's a simple truth that can be verified. Our neighborhood hasn't had a community recreation center since 1958. 1958. Definitions. There are two types of definitions for many words, denotative and connotative. A denotative definition is a literal definition, the kind you'll find in a dictionary. A connotative definition has to do with the emotional response that people have to a word. Community. It's defined as a group that shares a location, a government, and a common cultural background. The key word there is share. It's important to keep in mind that some words carry connotative meanings that may be negative. These words can work against the purpose of your speech. We need to work together to build this center for our kids. We need a joint effort, like the communists. Statistics. Statistics stand right alongside facts and definitions as supporting material that can strengthen your speech. Bluntly put, statistics deal with numbers. They're numerically formulated facts used to describe observations of size or frequency. Put that way, statistics sound about as exciting as going to a math party with Rain Man, but for your purposes, they can actually be pretty helpful. Statistics can help make quantitative comparisons, chart trends, suggest relationships, and summarize huge amounts of data. So let's say you're persuading the town council to build a new community center. You might say, 
There are over 3,000 recreational centers for children on the East Coast alone. Or maybe statistics show that cities that have a children's recreation center have a 40% lower crime rate for juveniles than those that don't. Or even four out of five dentists surveyed recommend that kids chew Trident at recreational centers. In any event, statistics really can help support the main ideas of your speech. Examples. Examples are another type of common supporting material for speeches. An example is a piece of information that's presented to the audience in order to clarify an idea or concept. Examples try to make a concept vivid and relevant to an audience. Two important types of examples are specific instances and illustrations. A specific instance is a fairly brief example. It's clear, it's short, and immediately illustrates a main point. You can use specific instances to support ideas that only require a brief reference to make your point immediately apparent. So suppose you were giving an informative speech whose specific purpose was to inform the audience on the dangers of mountain climbing. In that speech, you might make the claim, mountain climbing is dangerous for novices. A specific instance that supports your claim might sound something like this. Dave Sturdivant, an inexperienced 28-year-old student, climbed Mount McKinley on August 28, 1993. He died that day of grappling hook injuries. An illustration is an extended example. Usually it's told in narrative form, you know, like a story. Basically, illustrations are more detailed than specific instances. You should use illustrations when you're worried that a brief reference won't help the audience grasp your main point. One major type of illustration is an anecdote. Anecdotes are a little different from illustrations. Often they have more of a humorous, entertaining feel than illustrations. There are three different types of anecdotes. Personal, third person, or a fictional story that relates to the main point. Let's look at these three different types of anecdotes. Okay, assume you're delivering a persuasive speech whose specific purpose is to convince the audience that baseball is a dangerous sport and should be banned. This might be a possible personal anecdote. A time I remember when I was five years old. I went to the ball game with my dad. The grass was green. The sun was shining. All was right with the world. So my dad and I, ballpark franks in hand, took our seats in the bleachers. The game was fantastic, a pitcher's duel, but a surprise came in the bottom of the eighth. The shortstop, best hitter on the ball team, smashed a ball in our direction. The crowd went wild. The batter ran the bases and the ball rocketed towards my dad and hit him square on the forehead. On to play in the big leagues. Now here's an example of a third-person anecdote for a speech with the same specific purpose. The American pastime had treated him well. Then one balmy Sunday afternoon, John stepped up to the plate. The pitcher threw and John hit the ball as hard as he could. Hard enough to shatter a family, you might say. John hit a home run, but being a father sitting in the stands. John would never hit again. And finally, there's the anecdote in the form of a fictional story. These stories can help hold an audience's attention and illustrate your main points. Assume our last two anecdotes were entirely true and listen to this fictional story framed in the same topic. Let's watch. Casey was a baseball player, the mightiest in the land. When Casey strode up to the bat, he'd make a million fans. He'd run, he'd throw, he'd catch, he'd slide, and all the fans would cheer. We'll win the series, they'd all yell. We'll win it every year. And then one day he took the bat in a most important game. It was for the series of the world. The champs, his team would reign. But the pitch hit Casey on the skull, right into his head. And so the mighty Casey lay on home plate, stone cold dead. And there you have it. The three kinds of anecdotes, personal, third person, and fictional. If used right, any of these can make for a better speech. The other day I was out walking my dog, and I saw a few kids playing in the parking lot next to the grocery store. They were gathered around in a circle. At first I thought they were playing with action figures or marbles or something, but when I got closer, it dawned on me what their toys were. They were playing with glass, broken glass. They, they named their pieces of glass. One was named Pointy Man. One was named Infecto. The children of this town need a recreation center now more than ever. If used correctly, 
illustrations can make for a more powerful, more entertaining speech. Testimony! Testimony is another common type of supporting material. Testimony is information or an opinion expressed by another person. Expert testimony is the most common type of testimony used in speeches. Expert testimony makes use of the beliefs, values, opinions, and predictions of some authority or expert in order to support a speech's major point. Expert testimony is most useful when delivering persuasive speeches. In an audience's eyes, predictions or opinions of experts that are in line with your own often make a speech seem more credible. One easy and effective way to express an expert's opinion is by using a direct quotation. In her recent book, Small Hands, Big Hearts, local child psychologist Dr. Suzanne Ibid writes, Children have a right to a safe haven. Just having a place to escape outside of their own imaginations can make all the difference in a child's social adjustment. A direct quotation is the statement of another person's opinion or conclusion using that person's exact words. If the quotation seems too complex, it can also be paraphrased. But regardless of the circumstances, a quotation should always be credited to its source. And that's the scoop on support materials. But the preparation doesn't stop there. All these support materials won't do your presentation or speech a lick of good unless they're presented in an organized fashion. That's where the next section comes in. Section C, organizing your presentation. The next step in the speech building process is to organize your speech into a specific pattern. Because the fact is, audiences will more likely remember a speech if it presents its ideas in an organized way. Because your audience is trying to follow an oral presentation, any patterns and verbal cues you include will increase their comprehension. There are two important steps you can take to help organize your speech. Number one, identify the main ideas of the speech, and number two, make an outline. We'll be going over each one of these steps in detail and applying them to the informative and persuasive speech formats. So why don't we quit screwing around and get to it? Most speeches contain between two and five main ideas. It usually works out that you can come up with a lot more main ideas than you can fit within your time constraints. That's why you have to be selective. You have to pick out only the main ideas that are essential to the speech. So if an idea doesn't help you achieve your specific purpose, it shouldn't be included in your speech. Basically, the order of your ideas is pretty much up to you and what you might think have the most impact your audience might want. Just know that your strongest idea will be the one that will have the greatest effect on the audience. So, your strongest idea should either be at the beginning or at the end of the body of your speech. Your weaker ideas should be buried in the middle of the speech, not at either end. With that in mind, here are some common and helpful ways speakers choose to organize the main ideas in their speeches. Chronological organization. Chronological organization uses the passage of time to present ideas. That's a fancy way for saying you tackle things in the order they happen. So say you're giving an informative speech whose specific purpose is to explain how to build a tree fort. You'd organize your main ideas in the order that you deal with them when actually building a treehouse. You'd organize them chronologically. So your main ideas could be arranged like this. A. Gathering building materials. B. Building the treehouse. C. Furnishing the treehouse. Topical organization. Topical organization? What is it and why do you care? Well, people who organize their main ideas topically divide their ideas into topics. I'm not being sarcastic. That's what topical organization is. So, just for kicks, say you're giving an informative speech whose specific purpose is to describe the many ways you can have fun at a town carnival. For this speech, you could organize your speech topically, like this. A. Enjoying the rides. B. Enjoying the professional freak shows. C. Enjoying the starchy fried concessions. Cause effect. The cause-effect format identifies the causes and then determines the effects of a particular situation. Or you can use it the opposite way, identifying the obvious effects of a problem and then revealing their causes. So let's say your speech deals with the growing crime rate in the city. In a cause-effect format, you might organize your ideas like this. Cause number one, there aren't enough police officers to fight crime. Cause number two, the legal system takes it easy on hardened criminals. Effect? there's more crime. So, those are a few ways you can organize the main ideas in your speech. But just like there's more than one way to skin a cat, or to reattach that skin, there are other ways to organize your ideas. 
What's most important is that your organization fits the needs and style of your speech. But other questions still remain. Questions like, where am I going? The outline. Okay, most basic outlines begin with an introduction, proceeds with a body, and ends with a conclusion. We'll be going into detail on the intro and conclusion later. But for now, let's concentrate on the body of your speech. The body of your speech is denoted by a Roman numeral, and the main points in your speech are capital letters, A, B, C, etc. Then your supporting material, the illustrations, examples, and facts you're going to use to back up your main points, are located under the big letters and labeled with Arabic numbers 1, 2, and so on. So what you're doing is arranging your speech so it flows from general to specific information. Okay, now let's apply this outline to a real speech. Let's say the specific purpose of your speech is to explain how to avoid being mugged while visiting New York City. Your first main point, A, could be something like you have to be wary of your environment when visiting New York. Then you back up this main point with supporting material, anecdotes, statistics, examples, whatever best suits your speech. These are your tiny ones and twos. So the supporting material might be a statistic like 28% of all tourists are robbed at the bus station. Or maybe an interesting anecdote about your friend who was mugged in an ATM machine at midnight. In any event, this process is repeated for all of your main points. So, if your capital B is something like, be wary of the people around you when traveling in New York, you go on to back up this assertion in the same fashion. And that's outlining the body. But just as every tale has a beginning and an end, your speeches must have... Introductions and Conclusions You'll find an introduction at the beginning of every speech, but introductions can vary in complexity, so let's take a look at a full-fledged introduction with all the trimmings. A complete introduction has four different components. They are an intention getter, a statement of purpose, a statement of rationale or statement of relevance, and a preview of the body of the speech. We'll go into each one of these elements in detail. The attention getter. An attention getter grabs the audience members by their faces and says, Hey, I'm talking here, I'm talking. A good attention getter makes the audience want to listen to what's coming up next. One common type of attention getter is identification with the audience. Okay. Assume you're giving a speech on the many alternate uses of bubble gum to the members of the NGSC, the National Student Gum Convention, in Indiana. One type of attention getter you might try is identification with the audience. All of us here are students, and we all love gum. Identifying with the audience draws on something you and the audience have in common. Another great common attention getter is reference to the situation. When you do this, you acknowledge the occasion that caused the speech. Here we are, all of us gathered together at the Indiana Gum Convention. The statement of purpose is also a very common attention getter. This tends to work when the audience is already favorable to your ideas or when your thesis is really unexpected. When people think of the things they value, the things that are important to them, they don't often think of gum. Today, I'm changing that. Another winning attention getter, a startling statistic or claim. A strategically placed wad of gum just might save your life. Don't believe me? Listen up. The startling claim or statistic is really effective if there's a gap between what the audience thinks they know and what they actually know. But maybe that's not your speed. Maybe you want to tell a story. I chewed my first piece of gum when I was seven years old. I still remember it. It was cherry. It was tasty. The flavor was long-lasting. But I never knew it would save my life. You see... Anecdotes can draw an audience right in, especially if they can relate to the characters in the story. Just make sure if you tell a story that it leads you into your main points and that it's not too long. But maybe a story's not the way for you. Maybe making a comparison is more your speed. I looked at a box of baking soda the other day. You know, that stuff does about 15 different things. It cleans. It freshens. <laughs> I'm surprised it doesn't fight crime. It's almost as versatile as gum. Yeah, that's right. Gum. Comparisons are usually effective because differences and similarities are easily understood. 
Next up is the rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is a question for which no answer is expected. It's designed to make the audience think. The danger of the rhetorical question is that someone might answer it. What would you do if I told you the answers to your problems were in that stick of gum in your pocket? A final attention-getting example is the quotation. A famous folk song once raised the question, does the bubblegum lose its flavor on the bedpost overnight? Possibly, but it doesn't lose any of its other qualities. Bubblegum is... The right quote could be the perfect attention getter to rope in your audience. Just make sure the quote you choose is applicable to your speech. And those, my friends, are the attention getters. Use them right and there'll be a knockout introduction. That is, of course, if you make the other sections of your intro just as strong. Sections like the statement of purpose, stating the relevance of your speech, and the preview of the body. Moving right along. If you didn't use a statement of purpose as your attention getter, it's a good idea to include one in your introduction anyway. Usually, if you give the audience your thesis statement in the introduction, your statement of purpose is also revealed. Another must in the introduction is explaining the relevance of the topic to your audience. In this section of the intro, you tell the audience how your topic relates to them. This way you'll make the ideas of your speech important to them right off the bat. This will motivate them to listen to the speech. And finally, there's the preview of the body of the speech. By giving the listeners a preview of what's coming, summarizing the main points you'll be making, you can help your audience follow along throughout your speech. A conclusion. A conclusion is what comes at the end of your speech. It draws together everything that's been said and indicates what the audience should do or believe as a result of the speech. It's the last part of your outline and can be broken up into four parts. A. Summarize your main points. B. Restate your purpose. C. Call your audience to action. And D. Round off. A simple summary of main points is exactly what it sounds like. Tell them what you told them and be brief. The restatement of purpose is your opportunity to make a final appeal to the audience. It's your last shot to tell the audience exactly what you want them to do or believe. The call to action motivates the audience. It urges them to act. If your speech is about the dangers of mountain climbing, this step urges them to be wary while climbing. And finally, rounding off gives your speech a balanced, circular feel. So if you can somehow connect your conclusion back to the attention getter in your introduction, you're in good shape. So how do you do all this stuff? What kind of stuff do you put in the conclusion to make it as effective as possible? Well, a lot of the strategies for introductions can also be used in conclusions. A quotation can always sum up the purpose and topic of the speech with a few memorable lines. So I urge you, take a chance. As my fourth grade Little League coach once said, you can't steal second base and keep one foot on first. Challenging the audience we is a technique speakers that. sometimes that, use in a that, conclusion. You know, Challenging the audience motivates them to achieve the speech's purpose. And so, the next time you go into the bathroom, make sure to ask the owner of that bathroom, where are the peanuts? And finally, you can always offer up a utopian vision, which emphasizes what could happen if the speaker's challenge to action is met. And if we can accomplish this, if we can convince the powers that be to ban baseball, we'll live in a world free of fear. A world where we don't have to worry about a simple ball changing the course of our lives. Well, that brings us to the end of our discussion on the informative outline. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, is there more? More to life? More to happiness? More to outlines? Sadly, there's nothing more to life, but... There is more to outlines. Outline or persuasion. Now, I take it you're familiar with informative outlines. Unless you've just walked into the room, in which case you should buy your own tape. But if you're on the level, sit back and learn about Monroe's Motivated Sequence, an outline which is often used for the persuasive speech. Monroe's Motivated Sequence is a pattern of arranging information so as to motivate an audience to respond positively to your purpose. There are five steps in the motivated sequence which can be streamlined into an outline. These steps are the attention step, the need step, the satisfaction step, the visualization step, and finally, the action step. These five steps exist in a chain. Failure to fulfill any of these steps might send your speech down the drain. 
Right now, we'll go over each step of Monroe's motivated sequence in detail. Step one, the attention step. You learned about attention getters when we discussed introductions earlier. Well, the attention step in Monroe's motivated sequence serves the same purpose as an attention getter in a standard informative speech outline. The attention step just may be the most important step in your whole speech. If you want to make your audience feel a certain way, you've got to rope them in early. That's what the attention step does. The purpose of this step is to make the audience give you its undivided attention. This step should make the audience anxious to hear what you have to say, jumping out of their seats even. And Johnny Ringo's back in town. Now, how do I know this? Because just the other day, I saw him steal a milkshake from a little boy. Just pushed him over and stole it. Now, how long before he steals something from you? Step two, the need step. The need step demonstrates that a distinct need exists for the audience members. The need may be to know something, to change a certain belief or opinion, or even an institution that needs to be fixed. This is the step where the bulk of your supporting material should be. Your statistics, anecdotes, and facts can all serve to motivate. We need to force Johnny Ringo out of our homes. Every day he robs, pillages, cheats on taxes, kicks our dogs, pollutes our waters, poisons birds, plagiarizes our work, and sets up rigged carnival games in our town square. Now he is an outlaw in the truest sense of the word, and we got a civic duty to run him out of town, huh? So the result of this step should be that the audience should feel they need to know something or do something. It's the kick in the butt step. Step three, the satisfaction step. The satisfaction step presents the answer or solution to the need you demonstrated in step two. You have to convince the audience that what you're telling them will actually satisfy the need you've brought up. If we want to get rid of Johnny Ringo, we got to band together. We got to form a posse, confront him, and drive him out. Now, just two weeks ago, the townspeople of Snake Creek drove out Eddie the Tooth Skaggs. In fact, law enforcement surveys report that 78% of towns that form posses send their outlaws a running. The time to form a posse is now! So, any statistics, illustrations, or other supporting material that makes your solution seem appealing would be right at home in the satisfaction step. Step four, the visualization step. In the visualization step, you're supposed to intensify the audience's feelings or beliefs. Basically, you get the audience to visualize the way their situation might be if they were to see it your way. But maybe you're scared to form a posse. Maybe you just want to forget about all this, go inside and crawl underneath your bunks. Well, it's tempting, I know. But let's say we forget about all this. Let's say we let Johnny Ringo run free. In a year's time, he'll own this town. No one will be safe. Grandmothers will be afraid to go to church. Kids won't leave their houses for school. Cats will befriend dogs for protection. Now, before you know it, he'll be running for mayor. His campaign slogan, elect Johnny Ringo or else. And the way things look, he just might win. No. No. In the visualization step, you take your listeners beyond the present time and place and pose the question of what might be. You can conjure up a positive visualization or, if you prefer, a negative visualization of what might happen if your plan wasn't enacted. Step five, the action step. This is the final step. The home stretch. In the action step, you tell your audience what they have to do to make sure the need you've revealed is satisfied. It's your final chance to get people up off their rear ends to take action. So I want you to go home. I want you to grab your six shooters, your slingshots, your sharp silverware, whatever you got. I want you to call your neighbors, your friends, your clergymen. I want a posse out here by dawn. We want to take back this town. And there you have it, Monroe's motivated sequence. Use these steps so that your speech has the greatest possible impact. Start out with the attention step. We're gathered here today because we don't want our children playing with broken glass in the streets. To Move on to the need worthwhile. step. We need to build a juvenile recreation center. Show Follow up with the, the satisfaction step. If we can get this center built, we can reduce juvenile crime and juvenile injuries. 60% of the towns that have community centers think hit them with the visualization out. step. And what happens if we don't build this center? They find their kicks elsewhere. Maybe they play with glass in the sand lot. Maybe they throw rocks at cars from the overpass. And finally, I think it's round off with the action remember, step. So I ask that you dig deep into your pockets and clear your social calendars. All it'll take is a group effort and a lot of cooperation. Persuade away. Use the Thank steps. You. 
Make Monroe proud. Transitions. A transition is the bridge between two different parts of a speech. Good transitions actually serve a whole bunch of purposes. They provide a sense of flow to the speech, and they make it easier for the audience to figure out where you are in the development of your speech. In a good transition, you should always try to briefly summarize what's just been discussed, briefly preview what's coming up next, and provide a link between two ideas. There's certain word combinations that can help you do this. Combinations like not only, but also. So, it's important to always know where your fire exits are. But not only should you be aware of how to prevent being trapped in a fire, you should also understand the dangers of actually being trapped. Smoke inhalation. Other great transition phrases are in addition to, furthermore, and however. And remember that it's always important to script your transitions in order to avoid verbal clutter. Um, the, uh, the next, oh, um, geez. Uh, the next point I want to make is that, well, fire kind of, well, you know it burns. Well, you get the point. Scripting helps you out. It also helps to use signposts. Signposts are verbal cues that indicate where exactly you are in the structure of your speech. There are obvious signposts, like using the keywords first, second, or third to label the points you're making. There's also changes in delivery of a speech. Stuff like pauses, changes in rate, pitch or volume. All these devices are signposts that show you're moving on to a new section of your speech. But that's delivery jargon. We'll get to that in a little bit. And that's the whole truth, people. That's what you'll need to write your speech. So know these steps and guidelines. Write furiously, write clearly, and write well. Because the moment of truth is right around the corner. And that faithful day sneaks up on you sooner than you think. Part 2. Delivering the Speech. The time has come. After all the preparation, all the research, all the writing, it's time to walk down the aisle and step up on stage. It's time to rope in the audience, to make them yours, to make them eat out of the palm of your hand. Can you do it? Yes, you certainly can do it. But in order to present your speech to the best of your abilities, you have to learn about style and delivery. Let's tackle style first. Section A. Style. A long time ago, when America was young, speakers weren't as style conscious as they are today. They didn't have to be. Listeners would willingly sit through long debates and sermons, but in today's mass media dominated world, style is a big influence. You can bet rhetorical events of long ago would have been a lot different if speakers had to heed today's strict emphasis on style. The challenger is a Republican. The incumbent is a Democrat. But when these two minds go head to head, it's all out war. Lincoln, Douglas, Douglas, Lincoln. Watch the Lincoln-Douglas debate live from Illinois. A house divided against itself cannot party down. Style is a pattern of choices that distinguishes one speech from another. How you use language is really what determines the style of your speech. One of the biggest differences between speaking and writing is that you can't go back and revise a speech, and listeners can't go back and hear it again. Because of this, there's a higher chance that there'll be more verbal clutter in an unpracticed, unprepared speech than in a paper. So, here's a few pointers that might help enhance the style of your speech. Clarity. Clarity of speech is important. The more concrete words and images you use, those which your audience can easily grasp, the clearer your speech will be. And what makes for clear speech? Here are a few things to shoot for. Well, first off, it's a good idea to limit your use of technical terms and jargon. And that's neolinguistic psychochemistry in a nutshell. They'll only clutter up your message if your audience is unfamiliar with them. Remember, your audience hasn't prepared as extensively as you have for this speech, so don't make it difficult for them. You don't want to dumb down the message. This is a scalpel. It works like a knife. Now, does anybody know what a knife does? Just don't be too wordy. It's also a good idea to speak in the active voice. The active voice focuses on who does what. Conversely, the passive voice concentrates on what was done. Listen to the difference. Active voice. Captain Handsome saved the baby! Passive voice. The baby was saved by Captain Handsome! You see the difference? The active voice makes for a stronger speech. 
Rhythm. Rhythm is the sense of movement or pacing within the speech. A good way to create a sense of rhythm is through repetition. That doesn't mean you should be redundant when you speak, saying the same things over and over, bringing up the same points again and again, just going on and on about the same old information time and time and time again. <clears throat> just know that it's a good idea to repeat your purpose as you go through the body of your speech. Repetition helps emphasize key points, enhances the audience's ability to remember, and helps a listener understand the overall structure of a speech. Another fantastic rhythmic device is antithesis. Antithesis is the pairing of opposites within a speech, usually to suggest a choice between the two of them. So, when Kennedy said, Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That was antithesis. It flows off the tongue, moves the speech forward, and makes a point. Here's a little known example of another Kennedy antithesis. Error, this is not a sandwich with mayo on the side. This is mayo with a sandwich on the side. Too much mayo! Another way to create rhythm is through parallel wording. Parallel wording is when the speaker uses a word pattern that's easy for the audience to anticipate. Parallel wording is easy to recognize and creates a rhythm that moves the speech forward. When Lincoln said, We cannot dedicate. We cannot consecrate. We cannot hallow this ground. That was parallel structure. Here's another little known example of Lincoln using parallel structure. I will not eat it with a nun. I will not eat it at Bull Run. I will not eat it with my mouth. I will not eat it in the South. Imagery. Imagery is an excellent way to make your speech vivid. A vivid speech is one that's lively, sharp, and intense. Now, we already talked about imagery when we discussed similes and metaphors with supporting materials. But the concept of imagery is worth bringing up once more while we talk about style. You see, the more you tap into your audience's five senses, the more successful your speech will be. Similes and metaphors do that. So does a device called onomatopoeia. Now, I know onomatopoeia sounds like an exotic and cruel name to give your child. But onomatopoeia is actually the term for any word that actually makes sounds like its meaning. Words like moo and woof and bubble and buzz. Used correctly, onomatopoeia can enhance your speech. The buzz of the crowd, the crack of the whip, the roar of the lions, the tittering of professional midgets. These are the sounds of the circus. And that's style, baby. Be conscious of it and your speech will cruise along like a missile in space. Neglect it and your speech will sink like a child actor's career after puberty. Got it? Great. Now let's get out of the trenches and move on to the glory. Section B. Delivery. The moment of truth. When it comes to giving a speech, delivery is everything. A poorly delivered speech can make all of your research and preparation go for naught. So listen up and find out how you can make your delivery flawless. If you haven't already guessed, delivery is the presentation of a speech. Delivery involves use of the voice and body to create a desired effect. Good delivery has three general characteristics. First, delivery should not call attention to itself. It should seem natural and uncontrived. Second, good delivery should help the audience listen, understand, remember, and act on the message of a speech. And lastly, effective delivery should create a sense of empathy in the audience, a sense that the speaker feels what the listeners feel and knows what they think. The million dollar question? How can you make these things happen during the delivery of your speech? The million dollar answer? Well, success in delivery lies in two main areas, physical aspects and vocal aspects. We'll tackle physical aspects first. Physical aspects. Use of the body and physical movement will always influence an audience's first impression of a speaker. It'll also affect their willingness to take the speaker seriously. Changes in bodily placement and physical movement can even help mark transitions in a speech and keep an audience focused on the main message. The gist of all this? Physicality is important while delivering a speech. That in mind, let's look at a few aspects of appearance and body movement and find how they can work for you. Attire! What you wear really depends on the event at which you're delivering the speech. Some settings are formal, some more casual. So it's really important to know as much as possible about your setting before the speech. You don't want to give a toast at a wedding wearing snow pants and a tank top. One rule of thumb, speakers usually dress slightly more formally than the audience members. 
speakers have to look somewhat professional, or at least well-kempt, in order to enhance their credibility. A speaker who constantly pushes hair out of her face, adjusts his Red Sox hat, or wears clunky yard sale jewelry, distracts the audience from the main purpose. Basically, put a lot of thought into how you dress. The last thing you need is for your pants to have an effect on the impact of your speech. Yes. Yeah. 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 Posture. Posture is another major physical aspect of public speaking. How you carry yourself affects your audience's opinion of you. When you speak, make sure you stand up straight, but not rigid. It's never a good idea to shift your weight from one foot to the other and try not to cross and uncross your legs. Also, make an effort not to lean forward onto the desk or podium. Just take time to make yourself comfortable before a speech. You can make yourself comfortable by breathing naturally and standing with your feet roughly shoulder length apart. Your posture should say, doggone it, I'm stable, and by Job, I'm assured. The trick of it is, you should be relaxed without looking sloppy. If you can hack it, your speech will improve that much more. Body placement. A lot of the time, speakers trap themselves behind a podium. They cling to it and use it as a crutch. This is limiting. If you're speaking from behind a podium, it's a good idea to step away occasionally. You don't want the podium to be a barricade between you and the audience. Movement in the direction of the audience shows you trust them. Movement's also a good way to make clear transitions within a speech. If you're moving on to discuss a different point, movement of your body can let the audience know that. Gestures. Gestures are equally important in the physical presentation of your speech. Gestures are the movements of your hands and arms during your speech, and they're used to emphasize your ideas. Incorporating gestures into a speech is sometimes a problem for speakers. Speakers are usually pretty conscious of their hands. A lot of the time, they have no idea what to do with them. Fidgeting, clenching your fists, and any other unintentional hand motions will do nothing but distract from your speech. Well-timed, well-conceived hand gestures can really enhance a speech. Facial expressions. Facial expressions are bound to be an important part of your speech. If you're talking about something sad, you're going to look sad. If you're talking about something frustrating, you're going to look angry. And if you're talking about how great celery is, you're going to want to convey a look that says, Hey, I enjoy celery. In any case, you want to make sure that your facial expressions are appropriate to the subject matter of your speech. Somebody who smiles all the way through a serious speech will lose their credibility real quick. And that's why it's important for us to fight against all forms of disease. One really important point to remember about facial expression is that eye contact is extremely essential. In mainstream American culture, somebody who's unable to look a person in the eye is perceived as having something to hide. Also, speakers who don't look at the audience can't see how the audience is reacting. The audience's facial expressions can give clues about what interests them in a speech and what doesn't. This feedback can help you adjust the speech to their needs. But if you try to make eye contact with everyone in the room, you'll look like a jackrabbit hopped up on caffeine and sugar. Your best bet is to mentally divide the room into three or four parts and shift your focus between these areas. This way, every listener will feel like you're directly talking to them. Vocal aspects. The easiest way to make a speech fun and memorable for everybody involved is to make changes in the use of your voice. That's called vocal variation, and it's also one of the ways the audience will judge your credibility. That's why, right here and now, we're going to discuss some of the most important dimensions of voice. Stuff like volume, pitch, rate, and pausing. Volume. Volume refers to loudness of voice. Most of the time, the volume of your speech will depend on the size and shape of the setting it's delivered in. If you're in a large, open barn, you'd better be loud. If you're in a tiny cafe, your voice should be softer. In any event, being too loud or too soft can be a problem. Speak too soft. We will fight the enemy on the land, in the sea, in the air. And the audience will strain to hear you. But speak too loud. Choosing the right couch is important for any homeowner and the audience will feel uncomfortable. So make sure you hit the right balance. In addition to controlling the volume for the whole speech, changing the volume at certain points in the speech can help emphasize important ideas. Raising your voice stresses a really dramatic or important point, and lowering your voice causes the audience to really concentrate on what's being said. Use these techniques wisely! 
They're valuable tools indeed. Pitch. Pitch is the placement of voice on the musical scale, ranging from high to low. You know, like in singing, a soprano has a higher pitch than an alto. Like volume, pitch can be raised and lowered for emphasis. You can raise your pitch higher. Can we accomplish this? Yes, we can. Or you can lower your pitch. Can we accomplish this? Yes, we can. Still, you have to bear in mind that an extremely high or low pitch will distract the audience. Sometimes during a speech, your voice wavers and your pitch rises. And that's the truth of the matter. We need to cut spending. This is due to the tensing of vocal cords as a result of stress. To prevent this, try to relax as much as possible by controlling your breathing. This lets you have enough air to finish each thought. Yawning and swallowing can also help you relax your vocal cords before taking the platform. Another tried and true method used to create a more pleasant sounding pitch is consciously relaxing the muscles in your shoulders. Also, instead of projecting your voice from your throat, use your diaphragm. That's the muscle that forms a wall between the lungs and your abdomen. This helps your pitch because the diaphragm controls the stream of air over your vocal folds, which produce the voice. One of the most distracting problems having to do with pitch is speakers who deliver their speech in monotone. That's a speech given at the same pitch with no variation the whole way through. I'm sure you're familiar with it. That's why a carnival is so exciting. It has rides, games, cotton candy. It's easy to see why a speech delivered in monotone is so good at inducing sleep. You need to vary your pitch. Otherwise, you risk making your speech mind-numbingly boring. Just be aware of the quality of your voice and you'll be better able to adjust your overall vocal delivery. Swing! Bada, 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 swing! Rate. The rate is the speed at which a person speaks. It seems so often in this world of ours, people either speak a mile a minute or like a slug on a bad night's sleep. Where's the even keel? Where is the happy median? Well, when it comes to your rate of speech, the happy median is what you need to strive for. The average rate of speech is about 125 to 150 words per minute, but rate like pitch can really increase if you get nervous. This isn't good for a bunch of reasons. First, racing through your speech makes it really difficult for the audience to follow your ideas. If you're cruising through your speech like a chimpanzee on a mountain dew high, the audience doesn't have time to process and react to what they hear. Secondly, if you're rushing yourself, you leave the audience with the feeling that you want to leave the stage as soon as possible. If you need to slow down your rate of speech, controlled breathing will help you relax and put on the brakes. But don't overcompensate and go too slow. If you go at a snail's pace, you'll give the audience a chance to write shopping lists in their head or possibly remember that they left the stove on. So keep that rate even, unless you have something you want to emphasize. A lot of the time, varying your rate can be critical. For example, slowing down your rate can communicate serious calmness or sadness. And if we don't save our environment, who will save us? While speeding up your rate can convey suspense or anger. Lumberjacks cut down trees every day. Corporations bulldoze forests. But how can we live without shade? So don't be afraid to vary your rate. Changing your rate as you go can really affect the meaning of your speech. Enunciation. Enunciation is kind of similar to articulation. Enunciation is precision and distinctness in sounding words. So you have to make sure to speak distinctly. Then again, just like everything else, this rule isn't gospel. Some people over-enunciate, speaking in an overly precise fashion. George Jefferson. Who is he? And what does he have to do with you? This can come off as pompous and condescending. That's bad. Over-enunciating will only take away from your message, so try to speak distinctly, but naturally. Neff said. Pronunciation. Pronunciation is the way of speaking a word which is generally accepted and understood. There's a lot of ways to mispronounce a word. There's accenting the wrong syllable. We must strive to ban nuclear weapons. There's pronouncing a vowel short when it should be long, or vice versa. We must strive to ban nuclear weapons. And then there's messing up the word altogether. We must strive to ban nuclear weapons. 
There's no doubt that mispronunciation can affect a speech negatively. It can prevent your audience from understanding the meaning of a word, or it can call attention to itself and reduce your credibility. The audience will wonder if you really know your stuff when you can't pronounce the words in your own speech. So, if you're unsure about the pronunciation of a word, make sure you look it up or substitute another word in its place. We must strive to ban weapons of mass destruction. And those are the ins and outs of delivery. You learn stylistic techniques like parallel structure. We cannot, we will not, we must not go without a recreation center. Antithesis. The question is, not how can we save our money, but how can our money save us? And imagery. But I can still hear the lonely plink of broken glass falling against the pavement. You also got the heads up on rate. Anyone will tell you we must quickly charge forward. And volume. But the naysayers, the naysayers will tell you a community center wastes money. You've learned the most important basics of vocal delivery. Keep them in mind and the audience just might fall down at your feet. Jim, they'll yell, or Terry, or whatever your name is. Your speech is so good, we would like to buy you lunch and give you money. And you'll be happy. Happy like a fox. Because you know all they want is your public speaking secrets. Don't give them away. Make them earn it. You'll be glad you did. And that's the end of our program. Now you can sit back and let all that newfound public speaking knowledge sink in. Or you can get out there and speak up a storm. If you have any questions, just give us a call at 1-800-238-9669. And for more information, check us out on the web at www.standarddeviance.com. Good luck on your future speaking endeavors. And by the way, if this program pays off and you become famous or wildly successful, mention us, okay? <laughs> Go. They're going to build the center. Great. Now you can clean the garage. Introducing another exciting video series from Cerebellum, the award-winning Standard Deviance. Recommended by university professors and teachers across the nation, the Standard Deviants are helping students everywhere. The Standard Deviants cover all major subjects and present tough course material in an enjoyable and informative video format. Watch as the Standard Deviants help you understand today's most difficult courses, including algebra, accounting, calculus, chemistry, differential equations, English composition, finance, marketing, organic chemistry, physics, psychology, Spanish, statistics, trigonometry, and much, much more. Get started today with the Standard Deviants. Call 1-800-238-9669 to find the store nearest you or visit us at www.cerebellum.com. The Standard Deviants, 1997 and 1998, 15-time Telly Award winner for Best Educational Video. Cerebellum is a dynamic company started in 1993 by friends Chip Pausek, 27, and James Rena, 29. After reminiscing one night about their most memorable professors, it dawned on them that the entertaining ones were the best at bringing a subject to life and making the material easier to learn. Chip and James decided they wanted to bottle that enthusiasm for high school and college students nationwide. Hence, Cerebellum's line of videotape study aids was born. The tapes offer a supplement to classroom lectures and textbook reading by offering a stimulating visual medium for learning. Cerebellum now has 40 employees who work in a 16,000 square foot facility in Falls Church, Virginia. The Standard Deviant series features a growing line of over 60 titles from subjects as diverse as algebra to Spanish. <laughs>